Now let's, let's, uh, let's return back to the topic of accreditation if we can. Uh, what you heard before from Dr. Chapman is a very recent journey, four years in, in, in building to momentum in recent accreditation in a very large state. You're next gonna hear from Dr. Terry Klein about a very different journey, one that began many years ago and culminated at that stage, not finished, but culminated in being one of two health departments that was in the first tier of accreditation. So I've had the opportunity and the pleasure of knowing Terry for, we were talking about this this morning, about 15 years. And uh, I've gotten to know him since we both worked together uh, in the great state of Oklahoma. And now we get to continue working together because again, we're, we're both uh, on the Public Health Accreditation Board of Directors. By background, Terry is a clinical psychologist uh, and that's a role that I first met him in. No, not getting personal therapy as such, uh, <laughs> but rather Terry served as a commissioner of the Oklahoma State Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. And we collaborated on a number of issues together. Uh, since that time, Terry has had a number of other positions of incredible levels of responsibility. I'm not gonna name all of them. I would uh, ask you to see his, his bio. But among them, he was the administrator of SAMHSA. And I think, and SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And that's an organization that sets national guidance for mental health and substance abuse services. And so you see that uh, tremendous background and how you might tie that to our work in public health and integration of services. And Terry's also been, uh, and is now, of course, the state health officer uh, and secretary of health for the great state of Oklahoma. But he's also an immediate past president of ASTO. So he, again, has a very interesting perspective so I'm gonna ask Terry to come here and share his wisdom with you. So Les, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And part of that introduction almost makes it sound like I can't hold down a job. When you say multiple jobs, <laughs> multiple positions, short period of time, it's kind of the way that sounds. Uh, or short attention span, I'm not sure which. Uh, but great opportunities, uh, certainly today. So as you can see from this very first picture, I struggled even with the title. So you're on the title page and you're struggling. So it's not after accreditation, right? Because we are just at the beginning of accreditation. And as, uh, to paraphrase Les's comments from uh, earlier today, uh, it's not a destination, it really is a journey. And it's not an end point but it's something that we uh, strive to embrace. It has certain milestones and we've had those milestones, but it's a very important distinction. And I think part of the reason I'm here today uh, is to talk about some of that, uh, after that initial very, very steep climb uh, and the excitement of that, how do you maintain that excitement? How do you maintain that commitment to performance management and quality improvement uh, once you've achieved that accreditation? And it does, uh, include a different set of challenges. So the only other qualifier I would put on here is uh, looking at the people in the room and having conversations with several people, uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter uh, because I know that this is a room full of experts uh, in the field and experts in public health. So I want to commend you for all the great work that you're doing uh, in your respective jurisdictions uh, I know that there are people who have committed their entire careers to this topic and to the cause and to the movement, and that's exactly what it is, and you can see it taking hold today. So that's exciting, uh, but I am also very cognizant of, of being in a room full of experts. So in Oklahoma, uh, we did receive accreditation. Uh, we have uh, not just uh, you know, one office who's responsible for this work, but we really are integrating quality improvement across the entire organization. It is in our DNA. Now we're not at the point that I would like to be where I could say, go talk to any one of our employees anywhere in the state. We have about 89 satellite sites included, um, health departments, local health departments across the state of Oklahoma. 
So it's a pretty wide range. And I hope that someday you would be able to talk with anyone in the state who works for the health department. You'd be able to ask them about quality improvement, and they would say, well, of course, that's what we do every day. We're not at that point yet. I believe that we are at the point that if you were to ask them about accreditation, they would be able to tell you what that meant. Uh, but um, in terms of embracing quality improvement across the board, we're not quite there yet. To help us get there, so a little bit about the state of Oklahoma. We have two autonomous health departments, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And we have these 89 sites across the state. And then we have the state health department. So we're responsible for those other 89. So we were a beta test site. So we've been kind of in the march from the very beginning. The only state that uh, had beta test sites at the local, state, and the tribal level. Uh, so that was fantastic to have that experience. It gave us a little bit of a jump start. And Ron, in listening to your comments, you know, I'm wondering if there's ever a good time uh, to take on a new task when you think, I just need more money, I need more resources, because it seems like we're always struggling. Uh, the answer, really, is accreditation. So it's ab absolutely the perfect time. So when your resources are thin, or they're looking like they're diminished, uh, you need to figure out how to be as efficient, as effective as possible with those limited resources. And accreditation quality improvement is the best way, in my opinion, to actually get there. So it allows us to do more uh, with less. As part of that, and you'll see that in the very first bullet, uh, you may have to make some investment. And the question is, is true with any of your investments? Do you believe that the return on that investment will be there? Will it pay off? And if you believe that it will, and you have enough evidence for that, then you might be willing to take some risk and invest some of those resources. So we actually today have 17 uh, regional health coordinators, these uh, accredited uh, accreditation coordinators who are spread across the state. And those individuals are helping those local health departments that are under our uh, area of responsibility become accredited. So right now we have one already, Comanche County down in Lawton, uh, which is independently accredited. And you'll uh, hear throughout the course of the couple of days here, there are multiple paths. Uh, but we chose the path to have them independently accredited. We have about five more local health departments that are actually in the queue right now, which is exciting. And I was also interested in your research, uh, Les, that you mentioned, uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa Health Department as independent autonomous health departments are also accredited. So completely separate from the state health department. So we have today four accredited bodies uh, within the state we know, and hopefully you'll be able to learn more about the great work that the Cherokee Nation is doing. I'm hoping that they soon will be accredited. It looks like they uh, have been on that path from what they've said publicly. Uh, and that would be very exciting indeed to see that. But we've made that initial investment. So then moving beyond, how do you institutionalize quality improvement? How do you really make certain that it ends up in the bones of the organization um, in a way that is sustainable? So for us, part of that is around the Office of Performance Management. Uh, staff perform a, a number of different functions. And I will say, too, uh, we, are, uh, we have a $611 million shortfall in the state. This year, uh, we've had budget crunch after budget crunch. It seems like almost every year that I've been in this position. Uh, we are significantly smaller in staff today uh, than we were when I started. Uh, so to make this kind of investment, I think, shows a real commitment to quality improvement. And it also shows uh, a level of confidence in the returns that we'll receive from that. But we have a lot of activities that take place within this Office of Performance Management. And a big piece of that is around our Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan, which we just call OHIP for short. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So we have the accreditation coordinators who are spread out across the state. And part of our job is to make sure that they're successful. So we make sure that they get the support that they need in terms of technical assistance. So we are one state. I am not in any way implying that this is a template or a model for any other state. But hopefully there will be some ideas that may be triggered from some of this or some comparisons. And after you hear this presentation, if you have ideas on what we can do to improve our systems, I would certainly welcome that. It's almost like a free consultation that I get from two or 300 people right here. 
and I would welcome that. So a big piece of this is really working in partnership. You heard that from Ron's presentation, the importance of partnerships. So we are very fortunate in the state to have a program called Turning Point. Actually, it was initially funded by Robert Wood Johnson uh, and the Kellogg Foundation together. That funding ran out many, many years ago, and we have sustained that. So we have over 80 sites that are basically community coalitions. Uh, those are volunteer organizations, grassroots organizations that are looking for local solutions to local problems and really mobilizing the community and engaging the community. Very, very active across the entire state. So as we've gone down this path of accreditation, much of that work has been, so how do we engage the communities? How do we actually use some of the infrastructure that's in place? And we're fortunate that we're not creating that from the start, uh, but how can we capitalize on what we have available to us? And that's a question that I think uh, everyone would ask. Uh, instead of creating uh, necessarily a, a new infrastructure, let's capitalize on what we have. So we have our regional health directors uh, who actually cover, these are the administrators, less the terminology has changed uh, a little bit, uh, but they cover a, a great uh, chunk of the state under each of their jurisdictions and then we match them with the accreditation coordinators uh, to help share those resources, but really focused on how we pull the community together. So I had a conversation this morning at breakfast, again, a great uh, uh, compliment to the time that's built in for networking, I appreciated that. Had a, a brief conversation with Judy from Minnesota. Uh, I don't know if Judy's out there, uh, but we were talking about some of the uptake. Uh, how do you really get that uptake across the entire state? Um, and my response, uh, was accreditation was absolutely critical. So as commissioner, we come, we go, uh, we move on to other jobs, uh, but we have staff who are there, uh, many who are there for decades. So then the challenge is how do you actually get people to embrace the concept of quality improvement? And my response to Judy this morning uh, was accreditation was a huge help in doing that. So I recognize some of my own limitations as the commissioner. And uh, you know, sometimes you get these initiatives, they roll out across the state, and it's like, well, that's kind of the commissioner's initiative. And uh, they, they, being staff, may or may not give full support to that. But there was something that was very different about accreditation. Uh, because it was a, a really a national movement, it had uh, concrete objectives, it was something that all of our staff could grab hold of concretely, wrap their arms around, and embrace and support. So the story I was telling uh, Judy was that as I travel around the state, you know, it's about four hours, five hours to some of the uh, quadrants of our state, um, but I make that commitment to visit all of our county health departments. I had a conversation with the clerk who was up at the front desk, and she was telling me, so I know you're doing this accreditation stuff, and as we do this here, you need to really make sure to include us because we see every single person who comes into the health department and we know this community better than anyone else. I'm like, wow. So I have someone literally hundreds of miles from our central office who is telling me, I want to be included in this process. And I'm telling you right now, if I had just rolled out quality improvement, I would not have had that kind of uh, receptive audience. It just wouldn't have been there. So there is something qualitatively different about accreditation. So we're seeing that with the local community health improvement plans. Uh, again, as the state, we had, and I'll say just a little bit about this, we had our state health improvement plan, but we had not done that at the local level. So we have, uh, many of our health departments had a very good sense, I mean, of the community, have a very good sense of strengths and weaknesses, but it had not been articulated again in a concrete plan uh, with those types of objectives that tied in with all of these other uh, goals and objectives that we have. And so sometimes you would have certain areas of the state that felt very much removed uh, from the central office. You've got central office over there, and you have local health departments over here. This was really a great opportunity to help pull these together. For our Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan, uh, we just finished our five-year cycle with the Health Improvement Plan. 
And um, so we've entered into a new process to launch our OHIP, Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan 2020, because that's, it'll take us to the year 2020. And our kind of tagline for that is uh, bringing uh, health into vision uh, and into clarity. So OHIP 2020, uh, and we had a great launch this last week. So we spent a year developing this updated Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan, uh, which really is the blueprint for the state. It's not the strategic uh, plan for the state health department, and you'll see how these fit together in just a little bit. But so we have kind of our own marching orders for the state health department, uh, but this is really a much, much broader blueprint with a much broader group of stakeholders. So this launch took place uh, last Tuesday in a little town called Noble, Oklahoma, which has done some incredible work. So we were scheduled to have uh, Governor Fallon actually addressing the group. She ended up having a family funeral, unfortunately, at that exact time, so she was not able to make that. But a uh, great letter from Governor Fallon. We had Governor Anatubby of the Chickasaw Nation uh, who gave comments about the launch for the Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan. We had the city manager and the mayor from Noble uh, talking about the importance of health in this small, basically rural community. And just to be uh, very candid, uh, the best comments that I heard out of all, all of the comments were very important. They tied together separately, but the city manager was a knock your socks off presentation. So he talked about the importance of health for economic development in their community. The event was actually held at the school and he talked about the importance of students being able to learn uh, really as part of the contributors to the workforce uh, in that community. And it was all tied back in with health. And they had received probably three or four different grants. So he was also able to talk about, well, we've done this and we actually uh, built on that and then just this incredible uh, explanation of how he took a kind of a stepwise approach to building a culture of health. He had to catch himself a little bit. At one point he said, we, will, we are not winners in our state athletics, which is a very big deal in Oklahoma. Uh, he said, but we will be, so he kind of caught himself. But we are changing the way people think about us and our health. And he had made that commitment. So it was uh, fantastic to see that. So that year-long process that led up to that launch last week included 11 community chats across the entire state. Again, very diverse state. Uh, what's happening in the far northeast part of the state may be very, very different than what's happening uh, in the southwest part of the state. It's important to get uh, all of that information, pull that together. We had two tribal consultations. Uh, we have 38 federally recognized tribes in the state of Oklahoma, one of the largest absolute number of, of Native Americans in the entire country. Uh, so this is very, very important. We also had uh, some targeted populations where we've seen some health disparities. So we held uh, two listening sessions that were specifically targeted Hispanic population and two that targeted African American populations. And the information was fascinating. And as we had expected, actually we learned different things from the different groups. So it made me very grateful that we had uh, gone to the effort to do that across the entire state. Uh, but that helped to inform our uh, health improvement plan. So we've had for the last three years, we've had three flagship issues. A lot of other issues uh, intermixed. Those are the, the things that you would think of in most states, so tobacco reduction, very high rate in the state of Oklahoma, obesity reduction, and improved children's health. My little mantra about the children's health piece is, if we don't produce a healthier generation, we will never ever have enough health care, enough physicians, enough nurses to pick up the pieces. We just cannot catch up. We can't. So we need to create that culture of health. We need to make sure that we're producing a healthier generation. So as part of this relaunch, of OHIP, we actually added a fourth flagship. And so this is a big deal. We've had three for the last five years. And you heard this referenced earlier today too, and that was behavioral health. Mm -hmm. So as we traveled around the state, we heard over and over again. So we have high suicide rates, especially with returning veterans in the state of Oklahoma. We have out of control prescription drug misuse and overdose death rates 
in the state of Oklahoma? So we've heard that over and over. And the question is, so why is that not in your health plan? A little bit embarrassing, uh, given my history, uh, that that hadn't been in the first version. Uh, so we included that. And there is a separate Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, and they will take the lead in much of that work. But for the overall blueprint for the entire state, we need to practice what we preach. We talk about integration. We talk about the whole person. We talk about the mind, body, spirit. Um, we need to put that into, into actual practice. And we're doing that through OHIP. So that was very exciting to add that. And we have several other pieces, including health systems, transformation, uh, a big piece. And you'll see a little bit about that. So some of the examples of what we're doing around quality improvement, uh, the Oklahoma Health Care Authority is our Medicaid agency. So we have a whole slew of QI projects that basically the public health department introduced with the health care authority. So we are working more closely, have always had a great relationship with the health care authority, uh, great leadership there. But we've been in our nice little separate silos. And they're, you know, ensuring kind of health care services over here. We're doing public health over here. So through our QI work, we have formed these teams, and this is really a sampling of the work that we're doing together. So these teams come together, uh, put those QI uh, principles into play, into action, uh, and we are seeing results. So the other, the other realization that I've had, uh, public health, we're, we're the small, small guy on the block, right? In terms of all of the dollars in the system, when you look at the billions of dollars within the state of Oklahoma that are going toward the Medicaid agency versus the millions, and granted they are millions, uh, but they're small potatoes compared to what's going into the health care system. So part of our realization, let's take those dollars, not from the agency, but actually take those dollars to do public health work. And that's what this is. So let's put those dollars into play that makes sense in terms of the mission for the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, but also makes sense for us. And in applying those principles, make sure that we're investing those dollars and actually making a difference. So for every single one of these initiatives, you have a team of people who are coming together, who are setting concrete objectives, goals, deadlines, uh, areas and people who are responsible, and then tracking that progress. That's pretty cool. And then those billions of dollars that are on that side are really working hard to improve public health as well. Another concrete example, if you can't really read the numbers, but hopefully you can see the trend line, uh, this was around an initiative where we were focused on uh, reducing uh, non-medically necessary early elective inductions and C-sections. So we're concerned about birth weight, basically for babies. And we have a high... Uh, low birth weight rate in the state of Oklahoma. And as you know, that puts babies at huge disadvantage. And it came to our attention uh, that we have this high rate of non-medically necessary early elective inductions and C-section. I'm like scratching my head. I'm not quite understanding how that happens. Why would that be happening at all? Bless you. Uh, and one of the reason, so two very concrete examples, you'd be like, well, I can see that now. Uh, one uh, story was told to me, a, a couple who were coming home from the doctor's appointment, they are pumped up because they're having their first baby, right? So they just came back from their visit, uh, and they're excited because they're actually delivering their baby next Tuesday. And on the drive home, they're thinking, well, we're not really clear, why are we having the baby on Tuesday? Because the actual due date that we've been talking about is about a week and a half after that. So nice, empowered parents, they pick up the phone, not the driver, for those of those who are concerned about distracted driving, uh, and they call the doctor's office and says, you know, we know this will sound like a silly question and we've been working with you over the last nine months, but why are we having the baby on Tuesday? Well, that's the day I have privileges at the hospital, and that's the day you'll be having your baby, right? So that's not that much of a stretch. Another example from a different perspective uh, was someone who was trying to talk the uh, doctor into delivering on a certain day because it was actually would be the baby's grandmother's birthday, right? 
So you imagine this conversation. We really, and it's just a couple weeks. It is just a couple weeks before the due date. But we really want to have the baby on my mother's birthday because that will be the legacy. She's elderly. She's not going to be around that long. And then on every birthday thereafter for the grandbaby, we'll actually be celebrating the grandmother's birthday as well, who will no longer be with us. Isn't that a noble cause? So you can see these examples and how they happen. So we put together a QI project with the Oklahoma Hospital Association and a number of other champions to put in place a voluntary hard stop policy. So the hospitals put in place a policy that says, we will not allow deliveries at our hospital unless they're medically necessary. And there's a whole series of documentation and other things. And as some of you know who might be in the field, uh, particularly in this field, there are some ways you can massage those numbers. So all of a sudden, do you see a spike in medically necessary? We did. So then we pushed back. And as these collaboratives are in place, these learning collaboratives across the state, uh, we actually were able to get the numbers back down. So we've seen a 93% reduction in non-medically necessary early elective inductions and C-sections over a two-year period of time. And right now, it's actually at 95% because we had that last quarter, and it's almost virtual data too, which is fantastic to have that because they submit, the hospitals are submitting the data. But that's powerful. So that's the power of collaboration, that's the power of partnership, and that's the power of quality improvement. So we push that data back out every single month to the hospitals so they can see where they are relative to the other hospitals. They don't know the names of the other hospitals, although people know each other, and I'm guessing they can figure some of that out but they do know where they are relative to others, and there's a little bit of friendly competition to drive down their own numbers relative to their parts. That's fantastic. Healthy babies. Doesn't get much cooler than that, unless you go to the other end of the age spectrum. And uh, this is an initiative in the state of Oklahoma uh, that actually uh, was focused on driving down the, the misuse of antipsychotics in nursing homes to treat dementia because we have a lot of people who are receiving antipsychotic medication as a way of managing their behavior in nursing homes. And this is actually uh, within our entire department, and I'll just put this out here, and I absolutely believe this. The surprise to me, we had kind of this quality improvement um, uh, championing that was coming out of our regulatory department. So in the past, uh, our nursing home surveyors, the people who are going in and regulating uh, nursing homes and doing the surveys and inspecting them, was probably one of the areas that I would get the most number of calls from legislatively. I would get the most number of calls from somebody who's angry in a community. You had your staff go out, you know, they're citing the nursing home they're fining us X number of dollars, lawsuits. It gets a little bit ugly. So, Ron, you're spared that now. Uh, but it's a regulatory function, and it's a very, very important function to make sure that quality care is being provided in nursing homes. But that was really the extent of what we did until quality improvement really reared its head in the middle of this unlikely place, in the middle of these regulatory functions. So then we started to ask the question, well, what could we do to actually improve the quality beyond that regulatory function in nursing homes? So this was one example uh, that was put in place. There was a 15% goal reduction uh, that was initially established. It actually ended up being an 18% reduction, so they exceeded that, and they've continued to drive that down. This received the Quality Crown Award. In the state of Oklahoma, we have a Governor's Quality Day event. So we have submissions from all these different state agencies about quality improvement initiatives that are taking place. It may be in transportation, it may be in education, it may be in mental health, it may be I mean, all of these groups submit uh, kind of projects that they have going on in their respective agencies. And then there's an independent body that judges the uh, kind of the uh, level of awards in recognition. So you see blue ribbons and you get those things. Uh, the very top prize in the entire state is the Quality Crown Award. So the dementia, uh, 
project, the one that I was just talking about, actually won that top award. And I have to tell you, it was a pretty proud day. It felt pretty darn good. Uh, and you see, you know, you see a few people here, but the reality is you have dozens of people behind the scenes who really made that happen. And it was a proud day for them, too. So it's one thing, and this is part of what happens with accreditation, it's one thing to know that you're doing good work. It's something else to be able to actually demonstrate that, then have others recognize that, whether that's through receiving accreditation or things like this. Uh, but very, very powerful. Um, and I think a lot of times we don't necessarily um, understand that relative to other types of work that are taking place, public health does a lot of really cool things and really powerful, influential, life-saving activities that when you look at what may be happening in other uh, parts of government, um, we really have an incredible opportunity to be front leaders uh, in this march uh, in using quality improvement. So this is a big slide and uh, really was critical in part for me to understand. So we have all of these different things that are going on. It's like your head starts to spin, right? So you have a state strategic plan for the health department. You have kind of goals and objectives for individual employees. You have your Oklahoma Health Improvement Plan. And now you're going to layer on accreditation, too? People are like, oh my gosh. I mean, how are we going to deal with all this? So this was a, a slide that Joyce Marshall, who was the Director of Performance Management uh, for our department, she now is head of our MCH branch, did some awesome work, uh, absolutely awesome. And she developed uh, this great way of capturing this data. So the way that this looks, if you go all the way over to the right, this goes down to the individual plan for every employee, your performance management plan, kind of your evaluation plan. So what we're doing in every one of those plans, I want to see how that ties in with our strategic plan, and I want to see how that ties in with OHIP and our health improvement plan. And if that individual employee cannot demonstrate that they are contributing to either our strategic objectives and goals or our health improvement plan, then we need to change that person's job responsibilities because those are the critical functions that we have within our department. And it absolutely should be supporting that. And if your job is to change the paper in the copier, I need to know how that is going to translate into somebody else being able to do their job more efficiently, more effectively, so that we can roll out material, because we're not completely paperless yet, uh, how that's going to be critical in what we do. So you have that at the individual level. If you move over, you can see the uh, community and the county health department level, where we're really talking about those uh, community health improvement plans and how that information is critical. And then at the agency level, uh, I'll say a little bit about these strategic targeted action teams. Uh, and our strategic plan, our health improvement plan, all the way up to this national level. And that was kind of a cool aha moment too. We're not just influencing the health of our local county health jurisdiction or even our entire state. If we're improving the health of our state, which we are, we're actually improving the health of our nation. That's pretty cool. We are contributing to improved health for the entire nation. And I think that has been important in our conversations with our staff, you're part of a big cause here and you are making a difference in what you do. And you can tie it in at multiple levels. So we talk about, you know, when you're facing a budget crunch and morale may be a little bit challenged because there are fewer resources and people are working harder than they've ever worked um, and they know that they're doing the job of two people now, to be part of this kind of cause really makes a difference. It really does. So it goes all the way over. You know, Healthy People 2020, uh, accreditation, uh, United Health Foundation, Commonwealth Fund, a number of other objectives and, and goals that are out there as well. So another uh, system that we have in place is called our Step Up Data Management System. And uh, this is not that exciting. I'm just going to tell you right now. <laughs> so uh, this is a data system that we enter data into this system for every one of our programs. And as we do that, we are able to then track against objectives and goals, because for every one of those areas, we have certain objectives, we have goals, 
uh, just like you heard about for the health improvement plan, we have this for all of our programs. So then we're able to track that on a regular basis. And we have these called these STAT teams, which are these st strategic targeted action teams that are focused on moving the needle in these respective areas. And we have real live data to be able to support that. So then you have to go through the process of entering the data. I can tell you it's one of those mornings I dread when I'm like, oh, it's time for me to, to do this uh, because I have areas of responsibility as well as everybody else in the department. But it provides fantastic information. This, by the way, our Step Up Data Management System won the Quality Crown Award, the top award in the state, last year. So we have won that top award two years in a row, again, judged by an independent group of peers. So the pressure's on for this year. Uh, but we have some great things that we've submitted, but maybe, maybe I should intentionally step aside a little bit and let somebody else have that top uh, award. That's my rationale now. So we always provide a little cover, right? Uh, but it is important. I mean, and you've heard you know, the adage, it's important to know uh, where you're going if you don't know where you are. And it's important to know where we are and then benchmark that against our, our goals and objectives. So this is part of what the system looks like and part of the feedback that everyone has ac access to within the system. Uh, and we have some of those color-coded things to make it a little bit easier. So in looking at this kind of path forward, uh, which is really uh, never ending because the work is ongoing, uh, we have developed these leadership teams so we have individuals who have a, uh, the champions, really, for those areas that meet uh, on a quarterly basis. So we come together as the leaders for each of those respective groups, meet on a quarterly basis to review those, um, those goals and objectives. So how are we doing in moving that forward? And I can tell you at the very beginning of this process, uh, two things happened. So we said, well, you know, what are your goals and objectives? And we had, just to use as an example, one where it said, okay, we're going to reduce tobacco use by 5% every year. I'm like, really? I must think about that. Are you really going to do that? Uh, it sounded nice, and it's easy to put on the page. But when we started talking about accountability for doing that, do you have the resources do you, that you need to do that? Do you have a business plan in place to be able to do that? Can you show me exactly how you're going to achieve that? And one that's probably unrealistic. So let's put some realistic goals and objectives, and guess what? You are going to be held accountable for that. So think hard about the evidence-based practices that you'll put in place to get there. So this group meets on a, on a quarterly basis to really provide feedback to the entire group. Here's where we are, and if there are areas that are stalled out, uh, can we really utilize these champions for these other areas to help us problem solve around that? So what can we do? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about doing that? Um, you know, I heard you talk about this last month, but you haven't mentioned that recently. It may have been something that fell off the radar screen. Um, and there seemed to be this magic in state government. Things happen, it's almost like time uh, is uh, unlimited, and we would have goals that were set out for six months. And my question is, so what's happening in the intervening days? I'm not talking months. I want to know what's happening in the intervening days for this. Um, and to set a goal that's six months out without concrete activities taking place during that six months is just not right. And it's not okay to have this flurry of activity two weeks before you go to an LSTAT meeting, right? I mean, we've all been part of that. So if it's not realistic for you to work on it every day uh, in the way that we need to, then let's talk about what you've got on your plate because maybe you have too much on your plate and it's not being fair to ask uh, all of that from you. Our, for our uh, core accreditation team, we also have champions for each of the domains. So we have 12 uh, accreditation champions. Uh, these are individuals who do the deeper dive uh, to really understand more than anybody else in the department about those respective areas. They then make sure that others understand it as well. And then there's a level of accountability there. We're going to make sure we don't drop the ball. We're going to make sure that we're moving forward as we need to move forward. And we do these annual gap analyses. Um, so the central office was accredited under version 1.0. As you know, we're now operating in the state moving, or in the country moving forward with 1.5. So as a department that's already been accredited, 
Uh, then the question is, well, will we be ready for 1.5? Part of what will help us be ready is making sure that we're paying attention uh, as our new county health departments come online and as tribal nations come online, we will learn from them in this process, uh, which I think is, is fantastic. So when that rolls around, our reaccreditation will be ready. Uh, and it won't be, again, this, you know, we'll spend six months trying to do this, you know, download of the volumes of information. We're going to be ready uh, because we're doing this along the way. So the Cherokee Nation, if you have an opportunity to attend one of the roundtables, uh, the Cherokee Nation has been a fantastic partner with the state health department. Uh, we've shared training. We've shared some resources uh, to help our respective uh, organizations move forward toward accreditation, and it just makes sense. So you will also see that uh, the, we're putting out these toolkits, which are being customized right now. Those toolkits actually were the brainchild of uh, Lisa Pivik uh, with the Cherokee Nation. Uh, shouldn't we do something that's a little concrete, that's a little closer to home, that people can embrace and take? And it's like, great, let's do it. And let's work together to develop those toolkits. So we're doing that uh, with our tribal partners. So this is uh, actually from the Missouri uh, Institute of Community Health, which is a gap analysis, uh, which is something that we have stolen from Missouri. So thank you very much. Anyone here from Missouri? Thank you very much. We appreciate the hard work that you did on this. Uh, and it's the greatest form of flattery, right, when others want to use your work. Uh, so I would encourage that. Uh, but as we move forward, we want to make that accreditation process easier. Uh, and having tools like this that have been developed by others, uh, we have no shame in using those resources as they're developed by other people. So we've had, a, and I'm about to wrap up here, we've had a 141 quality improvement projects uh, since 2011, uh, about half of those happened after we received accreditation. I can tell you it gets easier and easier and easier as that becomes uh, more uh, ingrained within our overall culture. And you can see these are the things that uh, you might typically see within a health department anyway. The question is now we're able to track our progress, now we're able to really get the most uh, efficiency out of the work that we're doing. And I think it is really important to be able to demonstrate progress over time. So this is the last slide, which actually looks at uh, revenue collection. Again, something that's not usually seen as very sexy, very public health oriented. But because I've been in the private sector too, no money, no mission. It takes money to actually do this work. And so it's important that we drive as much revenue as we can. And this was uh, the very end. And this was when we had received accreditation. You can see it says, congratulations, OSTH. You are fabulous. Uh, and it was a great day and continues to be a great day. So thank you, Les, very much for inviting me here. Uh, thanks to everyone else. I look forward to seeing you over the next couple of days. Thank you.